So that will allow me to move immediately now to the central event of tonight, which is our lecture by distinguished professor Elizabeth Elliott, AM, FRSN, FAHMS, Fellow of the Australian Health and Medical Sciences, at the University of Sydney and the Sydney Children's Hospital at Westmead. Professor Elliott holds a chair in paediatrics and child health at the University of Sydney, consultant paediatrician at the Sydney Children's Hospital Network, Westmead. She holds a prestigious practitioner fellowship, her third from the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia. And in 2019, she received the James Cook Medal for, for 2018 from the Royal Society of New South Wales. It, that's the highest honour that we have. She was the first female among the 47 past recipients of that award. Let's come to the talk. It's her area of speciality on fetal al alcohol syndrome. Drinking for three, mother, baby, and society. So over to Professor Elliott. Thank you for that introduction, Ian, and welcome everyone. I'd like to start by acknowledging the various traditional owners of the lands on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. All of us who are parents aspire to have a baby who will have a healthy and happy future and is able to make a contribution to society. As a paediatrician, I'm acutely aware of the importance of an early start to life and life begins 40 weeks before birth. When a woman drinks during pregnancy, she drinks for three because alcohol can adversely affect the pregnancy, the unborn child and society. Tonight, I'll discuss the, the topic of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder in the context of our boozy society. I'll touch on the current state of play in Australia and the challenges ahead. Australians love their alcohol. We produce wonderful wine. The logos of our alcohol are emblazoned on our sporting heroes. Advertising and promotion of alcohol is rife, and alcohol is readily available even in the most remote communities and is often cheaper than water. Since the very early days of our colony, alcohol has impacted upon Australian society. The New South Wales Corps, or the RUN Corps, in 1808 took over the Australian government in the only armed takeover in Australian history. This was said to be in response to Bly imposing restriction on the Corps on the importation and distilling of wine and the use of rum as a substitute for currency to buy goods and labour. In contrast, Aboriginal people were not able legally to buy alcohol until after the 1967 referendum when they became full citizens. Of course, in the context of dispossession of land, prohibition of ability to speak their, local, their own languages, forced removal of children, alcohol quickly became a potent force to exacerbate disadvantage. Over 200 years after the Rum Rebellion, and 53 years after the referendum, alcohol remains a problem throughout our society. Australians are big consumers of alcohol. According to the WHO in 2016, uh, Australia ranked 19 out of 191 in the number of pure litres of alcohol that they drank per year. This is quite an extraordinary figure considering that 20% of us are abstainers, shown in the yellow line. However, 20 to 30% of us drink at what is considered risky levels for either single occasion or lifetime harm. The harms from alcohol are many, and I hope I'm not disturbing any of you who are enjoying a nice glass of wine at the moment. And although alcohol causes harm primarily to the consumer, as shown in this word map, there are secondary harms to others, including children, and in the case of the pregnant woman, the unborn child. The human cost of alcohol harm to individuals is, is actually immeasurable. However, the cost to society can be measured. 
As this slide shows, in 2010 in Australia, the costs of alcohol harm were $14.35 billion, attributable to loss of productivity, traffic accidents, criminal justice and the health system. The tax revenue from excise duty and, and wine tax, beer tax, etc., was $7.05 billion. And one might ask, why aren't we spending some of this income on strategies to minimise alcohol harms? Now I want to turn to alcohol use in pregnancy. Alcohol has long been used in pregnancy. In this etching by Hogarth of Gin Lane in London in 1751, we see alcoholic mothers feeding alcohol to their babies and oblivious of children falling to uh, their death. Gin was cheap. It was consumed by the poor. And by 1743, it was estimated that every person in England drank 10 litres of gin per year. I fear that a gin craze such as that which we saw in 18th century London has hit Australia. When I was Googling, I found this website, the Gin, Cream, the, the gin Queen, and the founder of the Gin Queen has spent some ISO time compiling a catalogue of native Australian gins. She said, we hit a landmark, 500 Australian gins in 2020, and this is up from 10 Australian gins in 2013, with an estimated value to the economy of 300 million Australian dollars. As you can see, it's uh, gins advertised as a Mother's Day gift, gin and tonic cupcakes recipes are provided, and even gin and tonic pizza. As she said, we have a great cocktail culture in Australia, and gin is one of the mo most versatile cocktail ingredients. So what is the global prevalence of alcohol use during pregnancy? Amongst general populations in 2012, the WHO estimated that approximately 10% of women drank in pregnancy. However, in some countries, this was up to 61%. However, unfortunately, alcohol use in Australia is quite common during pregnancy. The National Household Survey in 2016 showed that nearly 50% of women drank before they were aware of their pregnancy, and 25 continued thereafter. Um, I'm involved in three pregnancy cohort studies, the Aqua study, Triple B, and a Hunter New England study in New South Wales and Victoria. And women tell us 60% of them have drunk during their pregnancies, 20% at risky or binge levels, usually prior to pregnancy awareness. Similarly, in high-risk Aboriginal communities in the Fitzroy Valley of Western Australia, we found that 55% of women drank during their pregnancy. However, most of these women drank at very high risk levels. Interestingly, the National Household Survey tells us that it's older women, women of higher socioeconomic status, educated women like us, who are likely to drink more in pregnancy. So why does prenatal alcohol exposure matter? Well, it matters because alcohol readily crosses the placenta and very quickly the maternal blood alcohol level and the fetal alcohol level equilibrate. Alcohol is neurotoxic. Not only can it damage the uh, central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, it can inhibit nerve migration, it can inhibit the production of neurotransmitters, it can cause uh, brain cell death. Alcohol is teratogenic. That means that it can disrupt the development of the brain and other structures in the body and alcohol has epigenetic effects. That means that although the DNA itself is not changed, alcohol can change the expression and hence the function of genes, and this can be inherited to future generations. Also, epigenetic changes in association with alcohol have been shown in animal models to predict adverse health outcomes in adults. The risk to the individual pregnancy is impossible, however, to predict. It is dependent not only on the dose and the frequency um, and the duration of alcohol consumption during pregnancy, but on maternal genetics, on fetal genetics, on the mother's capacity to metabolise alcohol, on her age, on her preceding health problems. Thus, any child exposed prenatally to, to alcohol is potentially at risk of harm. In Australia, we have a binge drinking culture. Drinking in teens and young women is increasing. 
unplanned pregnancies run at about 49%. And as I've just told you, alcohol in use in pregnancy occurs in about 60%. Now, we do have guidelines, both nationally and internationally, that advise women who are trying to get pregnant or women who are pregnant, and indeed women who are breastfeeding, to avoid alcohol. But many women are unaware or unwilling to follow this guideline advice. And I think it's very important when we're trying to prevent harms from alcohol use in pregnancy that we understand why women drink. Now, we know from work we've done in Australia that many non-Indigenous women tell us they're unaware of the potential harms to the unborn child of drinking during pregnancy. And even those women who know about the harms will continue to drink if they have a tolerant attitude to alcohol use in pregnancy. So we'd show them a picture of a, a woman getting drunk in a pub, a pregnant woman, and ask them what they thought of that. And many people would say, about 20% uh, of them would say, it's their right, they can do what they like, uh, don't tell us what to do. In contrast, almost invariably, Indigenous women report that the reasons that they drink during pregnancy are either related to historic trauma, colonisation, dispossession, or to their present disadvantage, overcrowding, domestic violence, unemployment, etc. And it's very important to take a no shame and no blame approach and understand why women are drinking. Certainly no mother drinks to intentionally harm their baby. So what is fetal alcohol spectrum disorder? Well, some of you may uh, recall Jones and Smith described fetal alcohol syndrome in The Lancet in 1973. He described children born to alcoholic mothers who had characteristic facial features, birth defects, growth impairment both pre- and post-birth, and subsequently developed developmental and learning problems. We now know, however, uh, that this is part of a spectrum disorder. The children described by Jones and Smith, some of them had a structurally abnormal brain, as seen here, or a functionally abnormal brain. They had an unusual looking face, shown here, which persisted to later childhood. Some of them had major congenital anomalies, abnormalities of the heart, the lungs, the eyes, the ears, the kidneys, and others had minor abnormalities, such as those shown here in the hands, a short fifth finger, an abnormal palmar crease. So we now know that this fetal alcohol syndrome, that is associated with three cardinal facial features is the tip of the iceberg um, and that there are many children who have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder who don't have those physical features. So fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, FASD, can be described as an acquired preventable brain injury with lifelong consequences. It's caused by prenatal alcohol exposure. It's characterised by severe neurodevelopmental impairment manifest as behaviour, learning and developmental problems. It may be associated with physical features of the face, birth defects and growth abnormalities, but this is in the minority. I put this slide up because it explains why we get a spectrum of physical features with exposure to alcohol during pregnancy. And if you look at that first part of growth of the uh, embryo and fetus up to the first 12 weeks, the first trimester, that is when the central nervous system, the heart, the arms and the legs, the genitalia, the teeth, the palate are, are all formed. And so exposure with alcohol in that first 12 weeks may cause birth defects and facial abnormalities. However, in the second and third trimester, the brain continues to grow and develop and develop in complexity and indeed, as we know, continues to grow well beyond birth and into early adulthood. And hence, alcohol can injure the brain at any time throughout the pregnancy. Now, this is the type of child that I would see in the New South Wales FASD Assessment Clinic at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. This is, of course, a, a, a fictitious case. So let's say this little girl, Susan, I saw at age three. She was born to an alcohol-dependent mother who was 19 years at the time and drank about four litres of wine a day. So she was deemed at risk and was taken into immediate foster care. 
She was preterm. She was low birth weight. She was a bit irritable at birth and fed poorly and subsequently was slow to develop speech, motor development, and had difficulty learning her colours, for example. She had a squint, was emotionally labile, and was socially inappropriate, often going off with uh, people she didn't know. She had attention problems, hyperactivity problems, and impulsive behaviour, often climbing onto fences and jumping off. She had difficulty completing complex tasks, would repeat her mistakes, so would put her pyjamas on, her school clothes on over her pyjamas each morning, um, and was often deemed to be disobedient. She had a small head, microcephaly. She had abnormal facial features. She'd been expelled from preschool, which is not unusual uh, for our patients, sad to say, because of their uh, difficult behaviours, and she was failing in primary school. So one asks the question, what, what does the future hold for a child who's had such a bad start in life? Well, we know that the adult outcomes are also significant, so that adults with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder have increased rates of mental health problems, substance abuse, problems with sexuality. Less than 10% live and work independently. Many come in touch with the justice system. However, we know that early diagnosis and appropriate assessment of needs and strengths will allow the appropriate early intervention that will minimise the secondary effects in adulthood. Interestingly, there are studies just now which are, are starting to look at big cohorts of adults with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And what they're finding is a significantly decreased um, longevity. So the mean age at death is 34 years, often for su from suicide, accidents and poisoning. But increasingly, we're recognising that these uh, adults with FASD have a range of organic problems which may have been predetermined by alcohol exposure in utero. And of course, we know that in Australia, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder has a huge burden on children, adults and families, but it also has a huge economic burden. We don't have good data for Australia, but we know from Canada that the cost of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is up to $10.5 billion per year. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, first of all, we have to confirm prenatal alcohol exposure, and that's often very difficult, particularly with children in out-of-home care. We use a validated tool to try and estimate the risk to the unborn child. We look for neurodevelopmental impairment, and this requires a multidisciplinary team uh, to look at the child's strengths and also their needs. We look for facial and other physical features, and we do uh, use facial diagnostic software, which is available for analysing faces. And very importantly, we need to exclude other diagnoses, including a range of genetic conditions that can predispose to neurodevelopmental impairment. When we assess for neurodevelopmental impairment, I mentioned we, we need a multidisciplinary team. This can be done either uh, by a team working at a particular clinic, such as the clinic that I work in, or coordinated by a paediatrician, so a child's sent out for an assessment and uh, he or she uh, collates the results. And the sort of domains we're looking for, brain domains we're looking for impairment in, are things like motor skills, IQ, language development, um, attention, hyperactivity. And what we like to see, or what we need to see really to fulfil diagnostic criteria, is severe impairment in at least three of those domains of brain function. The next thing that I've mentioned is that we look at the face. We look for those typical three facial features. They are the small eye opening. This is because alcohol can affect the growth of the optic nerve and the optic bulb, resulting in a small eye and hence a small eye opening. Uh, if you look at these panels on the right here, you can see that in panels four and five in a Caucasian and Afro-Caribbean child, that very thin upper lip and the very flat philtrum, that's the area between the tip of the nose and the upper lip. Now, I want you to just have a look at the person you're with and see if you can recognise any of those features. But don't be alarmed. Many of us have one or sometimes two of those features but having three of those features should set the alarm bells going that this has high specificity and sensitivity for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder.
And as you can see from that bot bottom panel, these features hold fast whether a child is Hispanic, Caucasian or Afro-Caribbean. Now, I mentioned previously that alcohol is neurotoxic and it affects the development of the brain and, of course, the face. And this is because they share a common embryonic cell line. However, the timing of prenatal alcohol exposure is critical, not only, as I mentioned earlier, for the presence of birth defects, but for specific facial abnormalities. This sl slide shows on the top level a child, a mouse, and a, a scan of the brain of the mouse um, not exposed to alcohol. And in the panel below, a child, a mouse, and the adjacent scan uh, in which there was prenatal alcohol exposure. The alcohol exposure was at day seven in the mouse, which is equivalent to day 17 or the third week of life in the human. Now, I think you can see in the little boy in the bottom column those very small eye openings, which give the illusion of widely spaced eyes, a small upturned nose, a thin upper lip, and a very indistinct philtrum. And if you look at these mouse models, the one in the bottom has narrow eye slits compared to the unexposed one in the top row. It has a small nose. It has a long, flat philtrum and a flat, thin upper lip, not the normal curve that you would expect. And there are corresponding changes in the brain. Similarly, if we expose this mouse model to alcohol at the neurulation phase, that is the time when the neural plate is folding into the neural tube, which subsequently becomes the, the spinal cord in the brain. Um, if we expose uh, this animal model to alcohol at day eight gestation, which is equivalent to about 22 days in the human, we can see the difference between say A and E, B and F. So there's a significant difference in the brain as shown on dense surface modeling in the unexposed uh, animal at the top and the exposed animal in the bottom row. And what this slide also demonstrates is that alcohol can cause structural damage to a whole range of structures within the brain, including the ventricles, the pituitary region, the cerebellum, and the cerebral cortex. And according to what part of the brain is damaged, uh, then the child would manifest the appropriate uh, clinical problems. Now, this animal work is very informative, but it's also informative for us with regard to diagnosis. So classically, we've looked for the three cardinal facial features of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, but these animal models suggest that according to dose and timing of exposure, we may see a whole range of facial abnormalities. What this slide is, shows is the results of 3D imaging on over 400 children at the age of uh, just one year or whose mothers participated in a pregnancy cohort um, of over uh, 1,500 women in Victoria. Now, what we did was we did scanning. We did very detailed description of what the mother was drinking during pregnancy prospectively. And then at one year of age, we did 3D scanning on these children. Now, the 3D scanner is much more sophisticated than a, a digital image. It has 70,000 light spots, um, which help us differentiate the contour of the face between those who were exposed and non-exposed to alcohol. Uh, this paper was published in JAMA Pediatrics, and really the bottom line is that uh, unexpectedly to us, we found that even small amounts of alcohol during the first trimester uh, resulted in significant differences in the contour in children exposed compared to children who were not exposed to alcohol. So what is the epidemiology of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder? Well, this slide, very similar format to the others that I've shown you, um, presents WHO data. And it's estimated that there is eight per thousand cases of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder uh, globally. However, that rate is significantly different between countries. So, for example, the rate is 111 per thousand in South Africa. It's estimated that there are well over 630,000 new cases globally 
per annum, but this is likely an underestimate because these are not population-based data. Nevertheless, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is the leading cause of intellectual disability and birth defects, and it's preventable. So what do we know in Australia? Well, using a, a surveillance system, the Australian Paediatric Surveillance uh, Unit um, sends a little report card to every paediatrician in the country every month and asks them to report new cases of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And in a five-year period, we've had over 590 cases reported to us in children under the age of 15. And the typical child is a boy aged about eight and a half. Many of these children have been in child protection. Only 20% live with a biological parent, 50% uh, in foster care, others with family. Just over half of these children are Indigenous and 20% has a sibling with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, suggesting to us we've missed opportunities for prevention. Only 20% of them, as might be expected from what I've said, had the three sentinel facial features. But nearly 20% of them had microcephaly. That suggests severe restriction of, ba of brain growth. And very often, the most often... Um, most common functional abnormalities we saw were executive function, attention, adaptive behaviour, academic achievement and language. We also know that there are certain very high risk groups within the general population where the prevalence of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder will be higher. In the systematic review by Popova, for example, she found that the rate of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder was over 520 in adoptees uh, from Eastern Europe who were living in Sweden. There were higher rates in foster care, mental health services, justice settings, in rural low socioeconomic settings in South Africa, in orphanages, psychiatric care, and in Australian Aboriginals. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the Lilin One project, which we conducted in Fitzroy Crossing in Western Australia. And we found that there were 120 uh, cases per thousand. So this is a good news story because Aboriginal communities are really leading the way to address alcohol use in pregnancy and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. In 2006, the communities of Fitzroy Valley, and you can see in the red dot that it's a long way from Sydney, very remote communities, were in crisis. The women decided enough were enough and they lobbied the WA Liquor Licensing Authority to impose restrictions on the takeaway of full-strength alcohol, and this still applies. They can only buy low-strength beer to take away, no wine, no full-strength beer, no spirits. Having imposed these restrictions, they looked around at their children and wondered what was happening to them. Why were they struggling at school? Why were there behavioural problems? Why weren't they growing well? Why did they look a bit different from their families. Could this be fetal alcohol spectrum disorder? One of the community leaders, June Oscar, who is currently our social justice commissioner at the Human Rights Commission, described fetal alcohol spectrum disorder as a tragedy that somehow transcends other aspects of grief and trauma. Here is innocent young life, the future of our people, our culture, our language, knowledge about the magic creation and laws of our country being born into this world with brains and nervous systems that are so impaired that life for that person from birth to death is cruelly diminished. So they wanted to find out, was, was there alcohol use in pregnancy? Was there fetal alcohol spectrum disorder in their community? And if so, what could they do about it? They developed the Maralu strategy to address the diagnosis and prevention of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and to support families living with FASD. Maralu is a word in the Bunaba language meaning precious or worth nurturing, which is what they think of their children. Then they invited us from the University of Sydney and the George Institute to team with Manamudukura, the Women's Resource Centre, and Mindlingari, the Cultural Health Centre, to conduct a prevalence study of prenatal alcohol exposure and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. They felt that if there was no data, there would be no recognised problem and therefore no action. They wanted research data to allow them to take control of their own community. And so we conducted the Linlin One project. And this is the only population-based study to have been done in Australia on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So we took all children aged seven to nine in 45 very remote communities. 
And we found, as I mentioned earlier, that the rate of alcohol use in pregnancy was 55%. So half, over half of the children were exposed to very high levels of alcohol use in pregnancy, maybe 10 or more drinks, commonly two to three times a week, sometimes more. And what we found was that one in five, 19% of these children, had fetal alcohol spectrum disorder using very strict criteria. But overwhelmingly, we found that all of them had early life trauma, quite significant trauma, which of course may impact or make worse neurodevelopmental issues. So this was a difficult study to do. The community uh, led it and initiated it, and they felt it was beneficial. It had health benefits for kids and families, provided immediate health care, not just for FASD. It provided diagnoses. In children who had learning difficulties, there was extra help at school, alternative education pathways initiated. A number of community initiatives arose out of this, the development of a children and family centre, an early learning centre, a family violence shelter, the Maraloo unit to support families living with FASD, and a legal service. And subsequently, we've been fortunate to have been funded to conduct the Jandoyani U project, uh, which is a positive parenting program because many of these children had behavioural problems at home and at school. And we've been asked to conduct the Biggest One Kid project, where we're following these children up now 10 years later, just to see what were the predictors of, of good and, and less good outcomes. And we've also been funded by the NHMRC to conduct the Marud project. This is a collaboration between Royal Far West, the University of Sydney and the Aboriginal communities uh, to look at the implementation of telecare in these communities. So this project also provided recognition for the community. The community were praised for their courage in tackling uh, this difficult and, and sensitive problem. Um, the community were invited to present at the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and there met people from many other Indigenous communities around the world uh, who were struggling with the same problems. There was a number of educational resources, including books and movies and television programs, which raised not only awareness for the local community, but awareness nationally and internationally. And the data continued to to continue to drive maintenance of community-led alcohol restrictions. And believe it or not, these are constantly under challenge from the alcohol industry. Most importantly, the data we collected contributed to a national inquiry into fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, and it rather captured the imagination of the politicians. Um, the House of Representative inquiry reported in 2012 and following that, there was a national action plan to reduce the impact of FASD, the first for Australia, in fact, possibly the first uh, internationally. And from that flowed $27 million, uh, which has been used for a whole range of um, preventative, diagnostic, educational initiatives. We have just uh, had published the second national FASD action plan, and a small amount of money has been allocated, but just last week, um, I gave evidence to a Senate inquiry into FASD, and one of uh, their questions is whether there has been adequate implementation and funding uh, for the National Action Plan. Following our study, a colleague of mine, Carol Bauer in Perth, led a study in the only juvenile detention centre in Western Australia, and she found that one in three of the youth in the Banksia uh, centre had fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Now this um, was soon or soon vindicated um, by the Royal Commission who were told that fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and hearing loss contributed to incarceration. Um, you'll remember that Royal Commission um, in Dundale um, and the shocking images that came out of that. And I think one of the lessons for us is that it's very important to fully assess children with neurodevelopmental problems well before they end up uh, incarcerated. So what have we achieved in Australia? Well, we've fortunately been funded for a centre of research excellence in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder from the NHMRC. And not only do we train early and mid-career researchers, we've formed a, a, a large network of collaborators nationally and internationally. 
We've conducted significant new research in prevention, diagnosis and management. And we, more importantly, uh, we've had a lot of input into translating this research into policy through uh, acting as witnesses in, in inquiries, into clinical guidelines and, and into clinical practice. With government funding, we've developed the Australian Guide to the Diagnosis of FASD to assist clinicians in knowing what's involved in the diagnosis and uh, how to go about it. In New South Wales, we've had funding from New South Wales Health to develop the Cicada Centre. This is a very novel centre, the Centre for Care and Intervention for Children and Adolescents Affected by Drugs and Alcohol. Um, and it's novel, novel because it conv combines three services, the FASD assessment service, the family service for children who are living in families where there's drug and alcohol use, and the adolescent service uh, for children who themselves have drug and alcohol problems. And we have a multidisciplinary team, including paediatricians, adolescent physicians, neuropsychologists, occupational therapists, speech pathologists, and social workers, and of course, access frequently our psychiatrists, geneticists and physiotherapists. We've also had government funding to develop the FASD Hub Australia, and this is a, a one-stop shop for researchers, for policy makers, uh, for clinicians, and also for parents and people living with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and provides a, a wide range of very accessible and current information with an emphasis on Australia. The National Organisation for Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder also benefited from government funding and now has a helpline as well as a very useful uh, website. Uh, the Foundation for Alcohol um, Research and Education, also with government funding, has developed resources to help clinicians to ask and advise women about uh, alcohol use in pregnancy and to refer them to the appropriate resources. New South Wales Health has developed resources specifically for people working in Indigenous communities and also educational resources for youth and for dads, uh, as well as for mums and health workers. We have, as I said, a new National FASD Strategic Action Plan. It really now needs adequate funding and implementation. Uh, the first step is the formation of a National FASD Advisory Group. This uh, group has been formed. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have some teeth uh, in advising government about the way forward. A suite of grants has just been released relating to FASD and the justice system, early education, education uh, for the Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Register, for the hub that I've just mentioned, and for the Australian Guide to the Diagnosis. But we do have some challenges ahead. And one of those that we're in the, in the midst of at the moment is pregnancy warning labels. So voluntary labelling was agreed on by the government in 2010. These are labels that will warn pregnant women about the harms of alcohol during pregnancy. And many of the Australian bottles of wine and whatever that go overseas have this warning label on them. Um, but the voluntary um, code was unsuccessful we found that the labels were black and white, they were small, they were often invisible, they often just referred to a website. Um, and uh, women really didn't understand what they meant. So um, mandatory labelling was passed in 2018. And as one of the New Zealanders said, this is a no-brainer. Um, we've been waiting for this for a long time. The um, Food Safety Australia and New Zealand in 2019 came up with a proposal for a label and it's shown here. It says, health warning, alcohol can cause lifelong harm to your baby. This label was developed over 12 months with expert input, with community consultation and surveys and with a review of the literature. And it's quite clear that these health warnings um, can raise awareness about the harms of alcohol in pregnancy and indeed, the red label is very important to attracting attention uh, on a bottle. Needless to say, the alcohol industry resisted these proposed warning labels. And when it came to the uh, vote at the Ministerial Forum for Food Regulation in March of this year, despite our um, lobbying 
in the in the media uh, and at a ministerial level the Fazan's labor was not approved but sent for review so in July of 2020 they will be reconsidering this evidence based uh, label again now the food ministers defend the delay on these alcohol pregnancy warning labels. For example, Richard Colbeck um, echoed the industry's concerns about cost. The industry objected on the basis of cost. They've objected on the basis of the words health warning. They've objected on the basis of the red label. And they're worried that these labels might make people think that their product is harmful to the unborn child. The other big area that we need to tackle is advertising and promotion. And much of the alcohol advertising is targeted towards young women of childbearing age. So, for example, the one on the top, be a girl with a mind, a woman with attitude and a lady with class, drink Baileys. The one on the right is even more clearly targeting women. The margarita you can trust, it's only got 100 calories. It's natural, it's lightly sweetened. Um, but it has a lot of alcohol, uh, about 2.6 standard drinks per average glass. Of course, we've got to stop advertising to children and we've got to um, get alcohol out of sport. There are hundreds of hours in which children and others are exposed to advertising of alcohol while they're watching their role models. We also need to get the media on side. For example, a mum in, mum to be insisted that drinking during pregnancy was fine, and her furious partner was accused of overreacting. The rules about how to behave in pregnancy diminish women's freedom, or advice to pregnant women on drinking is patronising and sexist. I would argue that no woman wants to harm their unborn child and that every woman has the right to be informed about the potential harms to themselves, their pregnancy, and their future child. It's also important to persuade partners not to drink. Partners have a crucial role in prevention of alcohol use in pregnancy, and this was a very successful campaign, the Pregnant Pause campaign, where dads in this case were urged to give up drinking while their partner was pregnant. The other thing we need to do is to do what we know work, works to change behaviour. This requires political will and legislative change. We know that we need to address pricing and taxation, opening hours and liquor outlet density, advertising and promotion. We need to support community-led initiatives, particularly in Aboriginal communities. We do need community awareness and education and labelling. Um, but they will not necessarily change behaviour, whereas the other initiatives will. And I can't leave without saying something about COVID, COVID-19, the perfect storm. We've had information that alcohol sales have increased up to 70%, as has alcohol consumption. Australian parents tell us they're turning to alcohol to deal with the stress associated with COVID and with homeschooling, and many of them say they're drinking every night of the week. We know that mums and dads are now isolated together at home and there is a risk uh, of alcohol exposed to pregnancies and their consequences. So we've had a bit of a media campaign trying to urge women not to resort to alcohol during this stressful period. So in summary, alcohol use in pregnancy is common. Women drink to deal with the stress in their lives. The harms of prenatal alcohol exposure have been known for centuries and they're preventable. We have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is evident in many high-risk groups, but often hidden in the general population. FASD has lifelong consequences. These are unpredictable and often severe, but early diagnosis, appropriate early intervention will lead to better adult outcomes. We need to take a strength-based approach. We need to avoid stigma, blame and shame, both of mothers and their children. We need to have a culturally informed, trauma-informed approach when dealing with FASD. Australia has made great gains and Aboriginal people have led the way. But the future is prevention. The causal pathway to FASD is complex, but really that what that does is allow many opportunities for intervention. And you all have a role in getting the message out that fetal alcohol spectrum disorder 
is preventable. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure now to follow on that most excellent talk. Elizabeth, thank you very much for a very clear scientific explanation, medical explanation of what FASD is and what its consequences are. And thank you even more for seeing that in the social context. But my job isn't to do the proper thank you to you. Right now, it is to take your challenging uh, presentation and allow people to challenge you back again with their questions. And I'm going to start with one from my fellow vice president. Uh, this is from Susan Pond, who asks, does heavy alcohol intake by a male uh, impact spermatogenesis and the risk of inducing congenital abnormalities in his children? And it's a really good question. Yes, and it's a question that's um, currently of, of topical interest. So we know that um, only 36% of about a third of heavy drinkers have normal spermatogenesis, and that may have a, a variety of consequences. We also know that um, when dads to be drink uh, alcohol, they may uh, also get epigenetic changes, changes to the methylation of DNA and hence the expression of genes. And potentially those changes can be inheritable as well. Of course, if dads drink, the baby doesn't get fetal alcohol spectrum disorder because that is a direct effect of uh, alcohol, which crosses the placenta and, and as I've explained, has a direct effect both on the development um, of the structures of the body and the brain. Thank you. I think that's a very clear answer that uh, says there is a very important role for husbands to play as well, or husbands or partners. A question that I'm going to interject at this point, this one is from me. You said some very scary words talking about the first seven days and the damage that can be done in the first seven days. Very often before a woman even knows she's pregnant, and I think back to my career in educating young men and young women, but especially the women in this case, um, and talking about things like drinking and smoking and impact on babies. Oh, I'll stop when I'm pregnant. I'll stop when I'm pregnant. How do we deal with this kind of a problem? Have you found approaches that work, approaches we should be sharing with teachers and other educators? Well, first of all, uh, the, the model, the animal model I showed day seven and day eight is about, um, you know, 22 days, sort of about three weeks in the human. However, as you rightly say, many women don't know that they're pregnant. And um, many women have unplanned sex when they've been drinking and their partners have been drinking. Um, so it is a big problem. And, and we know, I mean, I've got young adult children, they've attended universities and colleges, we know how much they drink. And we know that particularly the women and particularly the educated women are now drinking to keep up with, with the boys. Um, so really, if they're going to be drinking regularly, if they're going to be binge drinking at weekends, they really should be using contraception. If they want to have a baby, they should then be stopping uh, drinking while they're planning to get pregnant. And there are certainly some new clinics available which are pregnancy planning clinics where women are given good advice about diet, about smoking, about prescription drugs, about alcohol, um, and the potential, uh, really how to maximize the health of their pregnancy and, and the health of their baby. But I think one of the things that um, you mentioned is, you know, how can we prevent this? Well, we can educate people but we've got to have the legislative underpinning for that. We've got to decrease access, ready access, to large amounts of very cheap alcohol. Um, and we've got to try and get the messages out about harm very early. So my eldest child's 30, she's never seen a cigarette advertisement. We grew up absolutely bombarded by cigarette advertisements. Um, and yet our children from a very early age are now being bombarded with alcohol advertising. Um, so we've really got to start getting the message out of the potential for harm, not only to the unborn child, but to society uh, in young children. 
and um, children are, are very influential in families when they understand the message about harm. Um, and, and you know, so we've got to be edu educating not only women, young girls, girls at school, um, and and older women, but also men, um, because as I said, a man drinking in the household or flatmates in the household or whoever's in the household uh, is one of the major risk factors for drinking during pregnancy. And you already have a follow-up question uh, on uh, from that. And it says, is, this is from Kenneth Dawson, who I believe is in Edinburgh right now, so he's traveled a long way to ask you this question. <laughs> Pay attention. Liz, he says, is there a possibility that too broad a spray at any alcohol during pregnancy dilutes the message to higher risk alcohol consumption? Should we provide more specific advice about drinking levels and accept that this is more pragmatic, uh, is a more pragmatic approach? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose one thing is, I think we need to raise the level of general awareness in the general population but clearly we need to target the people who have a drinking problem. Um, the trouble is, what is a drinking problem? I mean, a lot of the young girls these days will drink four or five vodka cruises, um, those mixer drinks, and some of those have three units of alcohol in them. So you have five of those, that's 15 drinks. They slip down very easily. And as my daughter says, but you can't taste the alcohol. So, you know, those girls don't realise that they're drinking at a, at a high level. Um, and clearly then there's a totally another group of, of uh, women who are alcohol dependent. And I think that that's where the role of primary care physicians come in, that um, midwives, nurses, particularly general practitioners, really need to get to know their population and, and be trying to advise them well before they become pregnant about the potential harms and really put them in touch with the appropriate interventions, whether it's motivational interventions or referral to specific drug and alcohol uh, services so that they can deal with their alcohol misuse problem, uh, as I said, well before they become pregnant. So there are those two approaches which I, I guess need to be parallel. I mean, prevention is complex, as I said, and, and we need to be doing everything we possibly can um, uh, right through from legislation to, to education. And you gave us some practical cause for uh, hope in this over a long period of time. Uh, Ian Constable... And, and just to see if I can just interrupt you, I, when I was um, thinking about the lecture, I, I really didn't want to um, be devoid of hope. So it's very important for people to realise that even a child who is born with a brain injury, there is great capacity for um, learning and for uh, development, provided there is early identification of problems and appropriate early interventions. And of course, the family environment is, is very important as well, as is the school environment. And hence, we're trying to support not only health professionals to recognise this earlier, but families to uh, be able to cope with the consequences and also early preschool teachers and teachers to uh, deal with these children in the classroom. Because unless they have major physical problems, the, the really dominant problems as they grow a bit older are learning and behavioural problems, both at home and at school. Thank you for that. I'm sure we're all encouraged to hear it. Um, we have another follow-up question. Just a minute. Uh, we have a few practical questions that are coming in now. Do newborn babies of heavily drinking mothers, uh, of heavily drinking mothers, suffer withdrawal symptoms after birth? Asks Trevor. Uh, yes, they certainly can, and they can be quite jittery. They can feed poorly. They can have disrupted sleep. Um, they can have a, a, a withdrawal, not as severe as if their um, mum's using illicit drugs. But quite often these babies whose parents use illicit drugs, uh, mothers use illicit drugs, are also exposed to alcohol. On the other hand, there are many women who use alcohol but do not use other drugs. Um, so. Oh, good. Another a practical question, um, an easy one. Does the philtrum have a function? 
Um, that's a very that's that's a good question, and I mean the filter. I, I've talked about the sort of classic um, long, uh, flat, indistinct filter without those two grooves that um, hopefully you you can see in your partners or in the mirror. Um, the the filter can be disrupted quite much more significantly than I've shown. So that depending on the dose and the timing of the exposure in the animal model, and we see this in children as well, uh, we often get cleft lip and, and cleft palate uh, can be seen more frequently in alcohol exposure as can other midline uh, defects. So then of course it does have a significant problem with regard to speech and with regard to nutrition feeding feeding difficulties are, are common. Um, but otherwise, um, uh, I don't think it has a particular function except to give that nice shape to the lip with, which is absent when you have a long flat filter. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, we have a number of questions that are moving towards the uh, societal and political situation, but I'm kind of grouping them uh, and we have a real, humdinger of one coming from Peter Bohm, one of our distinguished fellows. But uh, first, another qu a question about um, the mother of the child with FASD. Can you talk about, or talk about your experience with the guilt that women must feel? Does it stop them from getting help for their children or admitting that help is needed? How do you deal with the mother and the guilt she feels? And I think in two cases, A, if she ought to feel guilty because she knew and ignored or whatever, or if it was an accidental thing and she's just totally overwhelmed. Yeah, look, we, we see two groups of mothers and in my clinic in Sydney, the vast majority of children we see, 80% of them are in foster or adoptive care. So they're, family has been deemed unable to look after them and they have, as I said, then gone into, into out of home care. Um, and many of those parents, when they come to us, they feel guilty. They feel that they are poor parents. They've been told they're bad parents because they've got a child who's disruptive and, and not doing well at school, etc. So they have guilt in, in one sense, but, but quite different from that of the biological mother. And of course the bi biological mother does feel guilty, but I, I think we really do need to understand that women, I mean, why do, we, why do we drink? Why does anyone drink? Either we've got a genetic predisposition to uh, alcohol misuse, we have a risk-taking uh, predisposition, or we live in such stress and disadvantage that alcohol is a way to overcome those problems. And so we try to be as non-judgmental as possible. Um, sometimes, you know, we, we see women on several occasions before they disclose the extent of their uh, alcohol use. We always offer psychological support to parents. We put parents in touch with um, the National Organization for Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder, which offers a helpline and which also offers peer support from other mothers who, um, who are uh, in the same position. But I mean, there's, there's no doubt that all mothers feel, if there's something wrong with their child, often feel that it must have been something that they've done uh, that's caused this. So it, it's a very difficult problem. And I think we just have to be very sensitive, non-judgmental, and offer the support that's necessary. Um, unfortunately, some of the, the families that I see who have, say, a, a, a child in foster care might have four or five siblings in other foster cares who also have significant learning and behavioural and physical problems. Um, and hence, what's happened is that no one, no one has actually recognised um, that that mother needs uh, really significant care to overcome her problems with alcohol misuse. And the tragic outcome is uh, birth of several children in the one family. Okay, I'm going to try to fit a few questions in here. What I think might be a quick one, but it's from Eugenie Lumbers, who's going to thank you in a few minutes, so she better get her question in. 
Is FASD transgenerational through effects on the development of the gonads? Uh, well, FASD itself is not transmittable uh, because, as I said, it's the the direct effect of alcohol. Transgenerational, and she said. Yeah, well, certainly we see, yes, certainly we see several generations often of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So we'll see a, a child whose mother was, uh, you know, an alcoholic and whose grandmother was an alcoholic. And uh, that's really not uncommon, sadly. Um, and, um, you know, we see again that in often in families who are disadvantaged and haven't been able to break that cycle by accessing appropriate health care. And we also see it in sometimes in Aboriginal communities where there's been sustained uh, trauma, both in the past and, and in the present. So, yes. And is here's a question from Stuart Midgley, our host this evening. To what extent does the justice system accept FASD as grounds for diminished criminal responsibility? Well, Stuart, that's a very topical question at the moment, and we've been meeting recently with the head of the Children's Court in New South Wales, um, because they are very concerned that they're seeing a lot of children in the juvenile justice system who've never been assessed properly, and so no one actually knows what their cognitive capacity is, uh, hence their capacity to be a reliable witness, um, to, to understand a court system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let alone um, many, of, very few of them have had a diagnosis of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So I mentioned the study in the Banksy Hill Detention Centre in, which is a juvenile justice centre in Perth, and 36% of those youth uh, had fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. That's probably an underestimate because it was often hard to get the alcohol exposure data. But none of those children, I think, had had a diagnosis prior to this research study. So there's a huge need, um, and this is what we're discussing at the moment with the Children's Court, for clinical services to assess these children as soon as they present to the justice system, way before they end up being incarcerated so that their capacity can be identified and that they can be treated appropriately and, and you know, treated appropriately as they progress through the, the justice system. And here is Peter Bohm's question. Peter Bohm is a distinguished fellow of the society and uh, uh, not only a medical doctor himself, but also minister holding many different portfolios uh, in the federal government. He asks, what might be your hardest question of this evening? Some white alcohol sellers are setting up shops near communities that have decided to go dry. Obviously means indigenous communities. What should we be doing about this? Yeah, I mean, that is a very difficult uh, question to, to deal with. And, and in many communities where there have been alcohol restriction, there has been sly grogging. So people going out and trying to, to bring grog in. Um, I, I think really what we've got to be doing is to support the elders and the community leaders who have made decisions to impose restrictions and support them really to the hilt to be able to, to carry those out. So in um, Fitzroy Valley, for example, in Western Australia, there are various different types of restrictions. First of all, you can only buy low strength beer, as I mentioned, at the food liquor outlets. Uh, secondly, um, some communities have gone completely dry. Um, and thirdly, there is the capacity for a household to say that they do not want any alcohol in that household. Um, now that works well if you're in Fitzroy Crossing, where you can call the police to help get rid of someone. But if you're another 600K out from there, it, it becomes more difficult. So I, I guess the, where these community restrictions have worked well, it is where there is strong leadership, consensus following a long period of consultation, so that there's a real body of people in the communities who are prepared to um, stand up to, to members who are, are breaking the, the rules which the community has decided. So, look, it is a difficult question. Um, if there are 
um, I, I mean, I think in the old days in the Fitzroy Valley, the publicans used to drive out with crates of alcohol uh, on Dole Day. And I suppose what you're describing is a similar sort of problem now. I, I think the police need to uh, be involved and I think uh, the community need to be involved to enforce at a local level um, outside the community, I think the police need to be aware of what the legislation is and uh, to try and uphold what communities have decided is best for themselves and their children. Thank you. You did very well with that very difficult question. And it segues very nicely into what will be our last question. Um, we've heard about FASD and the implications uh, about the media and advertising and so on um, and liquor laws. We now have the lead poisoning, specifically the Port Piri case, but in many other places. And we know that children don't always get clean water, another social issue. All of these social issues uh, or legal issues which damage children do we need a declaration of children's human rights for Australia? Well, we do have the Convention for the Rights of the Child, which to which Australia is a signatory. And, you know, Australia does, Australia does pretty well um, in most areas of child rights, but there are certain areas which we really need to address. And um, the previous Children's Commission at the Australian Human Rights Commission has put out a very nice summary of, of what we need to address. So th there's, there's a whole range of issues. Um, there are certain groups within our society who are incredibly disadvantaged compared to others. And they particularly include children in rural and remote settings children in immigration detention uh, or refugees. They include children with rare complex diseases and they of course include our uh, Aboriginal children, again, particularly those in remote settings, but not necessarily. Um, so I, I guess what we really need to be doing is looking at all the social determinants of health, um, which, as you allude to, would prevent so many of the, the problems we're seeing. There is a right, every child has a right to clean water, to food and nutrition, to a home, to care, to be free from harm, etc. Uh, and I think there, there is a, um, a, a move from the Human Rights Commission to really uh, educate young people about human rights and about the rights of the child. Um, and to uh, allow them to have their, their own voice and their parents to have a voice to, to advocate for really what they deserve. And, uh, you know, we're a very rich society, well, we were before the COVID um, crisis. Um, we're, we are a, a very um, lucky country. Uh, we're a lucky society in that we have um, many resources. And I think we really... Uh, need to address the needs of those most disadvantaged and particularly children because they are going to determine our future. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. We're going to have to stop the questions there, but it's been fascinating. And the more you spoke, the more interesting it got. We are indeed a rich and lucky country and all the more so for having had your talk this evening. Fetal alcohol syndrome certainly has come a long way since the 1970s, both in terms of the knowledge gained and in raising public awareness as to the inherent dangers of drinking in pregnancy. From the 70s until the early years this century, I used to teach medical students about teratogens and fetal, fetal alcohol syndrome was one of those teratogens. Most of my knowledge at that time was gained from the international literature. And for some reason, I remember articles from Sweden. So it is particularly exciting to learn about how much has been done in Australia today and has been done. 
As a result of my reading in order to teach on this subject, I actually developed quite an acute anxiety about all the uh, children that I met and wondered whether or not I could tell whether their mothers had drunk too much in pregnancy by looking at their little faces to see how wide their eyes were apart and how thin their upper lip was. In those days, you see, it wasn't uncommon for women to drink during pregnancy. Therefore, I was really amazed by Professor Elliott's figures on alcohol consumption in pregnancy in today's world. I would have imagined there'd been a significant improvement, but in actual fact, I found them quite shocking. And I was particularly worried about the fact that women of higher socioeconomic groups who should know better were in fact indulging during pregnancy. However, I've got to say, the thought of drinking four litres of wine in a day, pregnant or not pregnant, is a little bit mind boggling. I was interested in Professor Elliot drew attention to that wonderful day on May the 26th, 1967, which was the day my first child was born. And therefore, because of that, I couldn't vote for that referendum that recognised Indigenous Australians. I must say, I didn't realise that recognition resulted in much heavier alcohol ingestion in Indigenous communities, and particularly by Indigenous women who suffer a tremendous amount of stress. Another aspect of Professor Elliott's talk that fascinated me was her reference to the gin queen. I think I only realised recently that in actual fact, alcohol has been used for many centuries because of the unsanitary conditions prevailing and the fact that drinking water was a health hazard. I also couldn't help but smile over the quote from George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion, gin was mother's milk to her, and Hogarth's drawings of the decadence of London society, or the London streets, I should say. But all in all, Professor Elliott's statistics on alcohol in pregnancy are quite frankly shocking. I think there is a real truth in saying that we are a binging society. I often wonder how much lowering the drinking age from 21 in my youth to 18 has resulted in a lifelong addiction to alcohol. I also wonder if it's possible that a lot of the behavioural problems that we seem to have in children today are related to maternal alcohol intake. But I realise these are areas that Professor Elliott is particularly interested. In conclusion, let me say, first of all, I want to thank the Royal Society of New South Wales for inviting Professor Elliott to talk on this topic, which I think is one in very important topic for us to consider in today's world. We are facing so many difficult issues that perhaps it's not surprising that people are hitting the bottle. Or that, but we must do everything we can to stop pregnant women or those women can contemplating becoming pregnant from drinking alcohol. I am afraid to say that future generations are really going to need every neuron and every integrated circuit in their brain to cope with the world that they are going to inherit. But enough of that. Professor Elliott, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your talk. I learned much. And I have to say, you really brought home to me the magnitude of the problem we face. Thank you.